Awesome. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Gray, and it is my true pleasure to open up this evening's uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to tell you all that I am a very proud double wildcat. I received both my undergraduate and my graduate degrees from UNH in 2000 and 2009, and I am currently serving on the UNH Alumni Association Board of Director Directors, but also have the pleasure of leading one of UNH's business outreach programs, the New Hampshire Small Business Development Center. The SBDC Center runs out of the Peter T. Paul College of Business and Economics. We provide in-depth business advising and education to small businesses with up to 500 employees in any industry at any stage of growth, and we do this all at no cost. So if there are any business owners on this call uh, or on the webinar tonight, I would love to connect with, you, connect with you afterwards as a fellow alum, but also to tell you a little bit more about SBDC services and how we might be able to uh, help you. Uh, but now, back to the UNH Alumni Association and why we're here. Um, also need to give a quick shout out to the incredible staff at the Alumni Association. Um, they serve as a bedrock of our UNH alumni community, working to connect alumni to each other and to university programs. They also work so hard to create unique opportunities for alumni to come together virtually and, you know, thankfully back in person again to reconnect and to learn and to give back to UNH. So on behalf of the Alumni Association team and board, thank you all for supporting UNH with your time today. You know, we encourage you to take advantage of your Wildcat benefits by visiting the UNH Alumni Relations website, which is unh.edu uh, forward slash alumni. We could probably pop that into the chat so you guys have that as well. Uh, but tonight's webinar, Confronting History is another episode in the In-Depth um, on Inclusion series presented by UNH Alumni Relations. Tonight's moderator is Bill Harris. Uh, Bill was a member of the History Department at UNH from 1985 until his retirement in 2019. He taught courses in African American history, the history of the U.S. South, and the Civil War to both undergraduate and grad students. He is the author of four books, including Deep South, which was one of three finalists for the Pulitzer Prize in History in uh, 2002. Before entering graduate school at John Hopkins University, he taught history in high school for four years as well. Um, our pa expert panelists will also have a chance to answer questions at the end of the webinar. So please note the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can submit your questions throughout the program. And with that, my job here is done, but thank you again for uh, joining us this evening and I am going to turn it over to Bill now. So good evening, Bill, and thank you. Good evening, thanks, Liz, and thanks for everyone for turning out. It's a great turnout on a, on a good topic. And um, uh, as Liz says, I taught in the UNH History Department, a really outstanding department, a great place a little sorry to leave it, although I've been around long enough, perhaps. Um, and I'm glad to see some of the grads back here tonight. I'm going to ask each one of our three participants to briefly introduce themselves and tell us about their background as a UNH person and particularly as a teacher. So uh, in alphabetical order, uh, Jacob. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jake Goodwin. I'm a sixth grade social studies teacher at the Exeter Cooperative Middle School. Uh, thank you to UNH for hosting this webinar, to Professor Harris for moderating it, and thank you to the other panelists for being here tonight as well. I wouldn't be here tonight uh, if it weren't for my sixth grade teacher. Uh, in sixth grade, my parents divorced, both moving uh, out of my childhood home, leaving me feel leaving me to feel alone and hurt, an experience uh, felt by many students who go through something similar at that time of life. Um, luckily for me, I had a teacher, Mr. Dowling, a Vietnam veteran, uh, who made school feel like a home to me. And it was uh, in that classroom in Pine Tree Elementary that I began exploring the Oregon Trail uh, and experiencing ancient Greece and finding myself in a world of imagination and creativity that he empowered us to construct. Great schools and great public schools, especially our cherished tradition in New Hampshire, uh, and one that we have a responsibility to help really maintain. And my hope is that together we can uplift our schools and the amazing learning of public school classrooms all over by sharing our commitment to building common ground. And so I'm happy to be here tonight. 
uh, to share some of the challenges that teachers are facing in the classroom today, and to encourage everyone here to stand up and speak out for the one institution that aims to serve all students, public schools. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, Scott Hancock. Hello, everybody. I'm Scott Hancock. I am teaching now at Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I actually am a UNH alumni in large part because of uh, Professor Harris, uh, because why I, this is my second career. My first career, I spent 14 years working in group homes with teenage boys who had made unfortunate choices in life and unfortunately couldn't make a living at that, didn't pay uh, enough to pay the bills. So decided to switch careers and I wrote to uh, applied to UNH, got rejected the first time I applied. So I wrote to Bill Harris, said, hey, what can I do to enhance my chances? And he wrote me a great letter back. I did everything he said in the letter, reapplied the next year, um, got accepted and eventually the benefit of a, a great scholarship for minority students there. Um, and I've been at Gettysburg, went to Alabama for a while, been at Gettysburg since 2001. And uh, one of the things that I still try to do, try to do then is join kind of my two careers and thinking about how history can help us understand why people make the choices they do and how we got to where we are, whether it's talking about individually or as a nation, which raises some interesting questions about presentism, as we know, has been a, a big topic of debate in among academic historians since James Sweet's letter uh, this past summer. Thanks so much, Scott. And uh, Marcy Baez is uh, currently a student in the graduate program at UNH. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcy Paez. I am originally from Houston, Texas, um, and I'm also a former middle school teacher at St. Augustine Catholic School, also located in Houston, Texas. I am currently a doctoral student at the University of New Hampshire studying history with a focus in gender and sexuality in the Atlantic world. Um, but I worked very closely with a lot of middle school students prior to my experience working as a middle school teacher all throughout my undergraduate program. I also participated in volunteer programs to spend a lot of time giving classroom help as teacher's assistants um, for the past four years at Emmanuel College. Um, but I'm happy to give a little bit of my experience and background in the current climate in Texas and in Southern states regarding CRT. Uh, thanks very much, and I'll be interested in your take on Southern states because I went to all segregated schools in the state of Georgia. The year after I graduated from high school was the first year that, uh, that my school was integrated. Um, we're going to take roughly a half hour to have some conversation from our panelists about some of these big current issues in how history is taught, how it should be taught. A lot of misinformation floats around about this. And then there will be time to uh, answer your questions, I hope. You can enter questions in the Q&A and we'll try to keep track of them. And when uh, in a half hour or so, we'll, we'll uh, try to ask our panelists to, to address some of those. Um, so to get us started, let me start with a simple question, which is a lot of these debates are based on notions of what happens in classrooms. And many of them I know from experience, these people have no idea what happens in a classroom. Uh, so uh, I'd like it, it, Jake to start us. He's currently teaching and he knows what goes on in his classroom and of course in lots of others. And just briefly talk about how you introduce history and history topics and difficult topics uh, when you're teaching yourself. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Bill. I, I'd like to start with talking a little bit about like the context of social studies education right now uh, in the state of New Hampshire. I've worked in Manchester, Durham, uh, the Lakes region, and in Exeter in fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade classrooms. Uh, and of course, there's a range of topics that are covered in those years. Uh, and teachers are always trying their best to provide an expansive depth and breadth uh, for those grades. But we face this major challenge uh, in, the, in, the, in the terms of right now, the politicization of uh, social studies education, but also for the last 20 years under No Child Left Behind, which was passed in 2001, which significantly marginalized social studies education. Um, 
the National Council for the Social Studies, which is the largest professional organization for social studies teachers, found that 44% of districts nationwide reduced time for social studies as a result of NCLB, um, and that was before the pandemic. And when we think of uh, the learning loss debate that's happening right now uh, in our country, that uh, after the pandemic, we have to think that there's gonna be even more pressure and with the addition of uh, this kind of political debate surrounding social studies, there's a huge squeeze on time in class. Uh, so when we think of uh, when we think of social studies education also related to NCLB, we have to realize uh, that NCLB was a punitive law that often uh, often punished schools that serve low income students uh, and students from diverse backgrounds the most uh, by narrowing the curriculum and really resulting in a focus on test driven uh, outcomes. And so you had many schools like the school of, that I worked at in Manchester uh, that was having limited time for R to PE and things like that. Um, and I would just give a, a quick shout out uh, to uh, Professor Miro Levinson of Harvard University, who had a great book uh, about a decade ago called No Citizen Left Behind about the civic achievement gap, uh, which shows that not only is there a gap academically, but there's an, a, a gap in terms of civic engagement um, and ability uh, and opportunity for kids of all backgrounds to be able to get a quality, high quality history and social studies education. And so for me personally, uh, when I was working in Manchester, um, there was, uh, in a fourth grade classroom, there was really little time afforded for teaching history at all. Fourth grade supposed to be New Hampshire history. It was hardly covered at all because of the testing policies. And so I think, uh, kind of in, in, in conclusion, uh, for this uh, opening statement is just, I want people to be thinking about, you know, the mandates that come out of DC, the mandates that come out of Concord, they have an effect on class time and therefore curriculum as well. And when we think about the politicization that's happening right now uh, around social studies, we have to acknowledge that teachers are trying their best to really meet the needs of the students uh, and, and provide an inclusive curriculum, all doing so really uh, under some severe constraints. I think you're muted, Bill. Bill, I think you're muted. One if you could say just a, a bit more about what you actually try to teach in terms of the content of US history. We, we can't cover everything for a middle schooler. Um, what are some of the emphases that you like to like to put in your classroom? Yeah, one of one of the biggest things that we really try to emphasize is high relevance. Um, so thinking about our local communities and bringing in speakers and bringing in uh, connecting to local organizations. Uh, my colleagues uh, around the area have also uh, worked with uh, the New Hampshire uh, Black History and Black Heritage uh, organizations, the um, the African burial grounds. Uh, and and just really trying to to bring in um, different viewpoints that you know a generation ago or even maybe 10, 15 years ago wouldn't have maybe been included within the social studies curriculum. Thanks. Uh, what if I could ask Marcy how that comports with her experience and she's, you've also taught that middle school level, uh, although in a Catholic institution, so the the pressures might be quite different. Some more in some ways, less in some ways. Yeah, in many ways, I think that a Catholic institution, because they follow the, the traditional um, rules of Catholicism, also typically fall in line with a lot of these far right ideologies that are perpetuating um, CRT as a negative ideology. But also, I think that my experience with middle school in terms of the Catholic school in Texas also gets at, tacked on to the fact that we were not allowed to talk about certain things in the classroom. And that was made very clear during certain, certain teacher meetings before I started teaching. Um, for example, we weren't allowed to talk about reproductive rights. Um, we weren't really allowed to talk about the true reasoning behind um, the Civil War, right? We still use textbooks that were about 20 years old. Um, all produced in Texas, naturally, um, that necessarily said they were, it was over states' rights, right? And we were not really allowed to dive really further, deeper into that. In terms of curriculum building, too, a lot of that was not really people who were educators. 
Um, TEA, which is the Texas Education Association, um, has been having a really big battle as of lately about curriculum building and how to make it more diverse and inclusive. Um, and it's something that has been consistently pushed back by the current administration, um, perpetrated by Governor Greg Abbott. Uh, thanks. Um, Scott, maybe you could weigh in a little bit on this. You're teaching at a college level. It's a private institution. It's a very good institution. It's also in the middle of all this history, quite literally, in Gettysburg. And um, do you have a sense of feeling the same pressures, or is it just very different when you're dealing with, say, freshmen or, or sophomores in, in college? Need to unmute. You're muted there, so you need to, same mistake I made. Well, you, you think I'd have this down by now. Uh, so at a, as a tenured professor, I don't have a lot of the same pressures and worries that uh, Jacob and Marcy and, and other people with teaching uh, in schools do. Um, there is some, uh, coming from a different angle, which is we have had a few students, particularly those of us who teach courses that deal with race or black history or, or gender, things like that. Um, a more recent phenomena, and it happened actually to a physics professor here recently, are students who are um, either intending beforehand or after the fact to use anything that they find objectionable and um, entering into the political realm. So for instance, we had a student who said that a physics professor who was discussing the fact that physics is dominated by white men, that student then uh, and their mother went on a very strongly right-leaning uh, web show and used this as a complaint that you know they're being force-fed things, that it's leftist ideology. And that professor has received a number of uh, really nasty emails, um, hundreds of them from what I've heard. So there are ways in which, I mean, but, but I don't have to worry about that affecting my job. You know, I'm not gonna lose my job for things like that. I've gotten nasty emails and threats and things like that over the, in the past before. But I think what has shifted more recently is the ability of a very small group of students to plug into national media outlets uh, that can provide them with support and a platform. Uh, thanks. The, yeah, the rise of social media clearly has a potential huge impact on everybody. And you've, uh, sounds like your colleague mainly, rather than you so far, uh, has uh, suffered from some of that. Um, maybe we can sort of shift into a related topic, which is that there are lots of legislatures seeking to pass bills. Many of them have already passed. Um, of the legislatures in the country have had bills introduced to try to prevent students from studying things that upset them, basically, is how I, I read it. And uh, not all of these have passed, but in a couple of dozen, close to a couple of dozen states, some bill or other has passed. And um, maybe we can briefly talk about whether you have experienced that directly. Uh, maybe I'll start with Marcy, since she mentioned some of that. We're, were the pressures you were feeling, for example, that the Civil War was not about slavery, it was about states' rights, did that come from the Catholic educational authorities? Were people mostly paying attention to state controversies? Uh, where did you feel the pressure coming from? Believe it or not, I don't really necessarily think that it was the Catholic education system. I think that we were living in a period where we were starting to discuss the RG more seriously, and it was being discussed through legislative means. Um, and I believe this past year in June, we actually did pass a bill that was prohibiting teachers from discussing current events and relating them back to racism um, or even structural racism in the United States. Um, but also part of that meant that any courses that taught any civic duties, you could not receive credits for. 
Um, so that kind of put a lot of us teachers in a very awkward position because part of our position as teachers is to teach these civic duties, part of what being a de- in a democracy means. Um, and so we had to circumvent a lot, a lot of that by not really getting a chance to dive deep into the more nuanced issues and complex issues with a lot of middle schoolers that were really questioning the history around them. I was teaching in the middle of the pandemic, and so a lot of them were curious. Have we ever experienced anything like this before, right? What are some of the realities of not knowing our histories, right? Um, And so it was very difficult for us to be able to address that, especially just the looming fear. Mind you, when I was teaching, that law had not even passed, and I was not the only teacher who felt that pressure. I had friends who were public school teachers, who said the same thing. They were a principal had gotten together with them. Please don't discuss the following things in your classroom. It's not because we don't want you to. It's just that we know the retribution against you might be coming sometime soon. Um, So it put us in very uncomfortable positions. I think it's very different to here in New Hampshire, where I have read and seen things of teachers being actively persecuted. Um, And I have read a few stories since I've left Texas of of similar things happening, but I wonder too the truth of what is actually being taught and how controversial it actually might be and whether if it's actually even related to CRT as opposed to just teaching general history, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, So could you give us an example of a civic thing you weren't supposed to teach? That, That seems like a pretty odd Oh, I can give you many. Um, so uh, I wasn't actually allowed to hold um, politi- any political discussions in the classroom whatsoever. Um, not anything left, right, centrist at all. Um, I could not actually, part of some of the um, public school curriculum in Texas used to be, it no longer is, that we could hold, you know, what if elections, right? Where we present candidates' ideologies and then we have students vote based on what they think is morally or ethically correct. Those were no longer allowed within our classroom space as well. Um, Really, we were not allowed to talk about any current events as well. So, for example, if students came to the classroom the next day and they were discussing things like abortion rights, um, I was not allowed to address them. I could only shut them down, Um, which was really devastating because you want to encourage this kind of critical thinking and allow students to make their own decision whether you agree with it or not. Right. Um, And there is no middle ground in Texas right now. There's no saying, well, maybe you should go look it up. Right. Well, the accessibility to a lot of the students that I was teaching, I teach in a very low income neighborhood, uh, meant that a lot of them didn't have computers at home. They didn't have accessibility to be able to get on the Internet. So the ability to get on the Internet was at school. And if they weren't allowed to look it up at school, then they were really negating the process of being able to kind of learn that authentically. Thanks. Um, So, Jake, you mentioned some of the changes in curriculum meant that you literally did not have enough time to teach stuff. Have you had experiences similar to Marcy's where uh, either directly or indirectly it was, you were made to understand you cannot teach about this subject, even if you try to teach it from multiple uh, directions uh, or any of that sort of thing, perhaps from parents, perhaps from administrators? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that I've been super lucky uh, and in Exeter and that our administration has been uh, very supportive of us and our teaching uh, and have respected our professional autonomy. But I think that uh, related to what was said, you know, last year, all teachers in New Hampshire were teaching with a $500 bounty over their head uh, with a threat to report them uh, for for teaching CRT. and I think you know laws of this kind have the intent of chilling classroom conversation. And uh, in the case of the state of New Hampshire, the restrictions that were set forth by HB2 uh, were first rejected as an independent bill. Uh, and then the legislature received a significant number of emails and calls where people were speaking up against the passage of that kind of restrictive legislation. Uh, and they decided they weren't gonna try and pass it as an independent bill. And instead they decided to abandon that and package it and hide it in a budget bill uh, as a means of pushing it through. And the requirements for the bill are so unclear 
uh, in HB2, that nobody really understood what was permitted and what was really restricted. And after a while, uh, the, it was so confusing that the New Hampshire Department of Justice had to issue a statement of guidance to try to clarify what was indeed prohibited by the bill. And the confusion by design of the bill uh, really was just meant to intimidate teachers. And after all, and after all, like you have to think like the penalty for violating this law was so harsh. It was career death, right? Career death, a total loss of your licensure and ability to earn your income. And you have to remember that this is at the time uh, that teachers like every, everyone else in the middle class uh, was feeling the insecurity of, of the moment, of the pandemic, of inflation. And the law play, placed also additional costs on districts in terms of uh, teacher retention and recruitment, compounding the, the staffing shortage uh, that is currently going on across schools. When, if you were to look at Ed Jobs New Hampshire today, which is the main place to find a job in teaching in New Hampshire, you will find that there are positions in social studies right now. You'll find that there's almost every, uh, across the board, a shortage. Uh, the law only aggravated that. And I would just say that, you know, when I was applying for jobs, I was one of 100 applicants for almost every position that I applied to. I mean, think about that. The impact of a law like this is you're having less and less highly trained certified teachers available to teach our students and provide an accurate and factual in, uh, accounting of history uh, for, for kids. And I just think that, you know, the intent of the law to me is to create distrust between parents and teachers, but it didn't work. Uh, in my opinion, in that sense, because, you know, in my opinion, talking to talking to parents and community members of diverse political viewpoints, they didn't buy that. And also, uh, you can look at the polling data. Gallup had a poll in September that said, you know, are you satisfied with local teachers? Uh, there was an increase throughout the pandemic. Uh, the survey also compared from 2021 till now. In uh, 2021, there was 73% uh, positive sentiment uh, for teachers amongst the general population of parents. Today, 80%. So in the end, I think that we need to provide students with a space to have conversation about the past and the present. And to do that, we need to be clear-eyed on the purpose of this kind of law and the impact it's having on our schools. That way, we can speak out against such attacks on public space, because that's what this really was. It's an attempt to close down conversation and, and really, really cut it off. Uh, thanks. That's, I, I'm glad you sort of brought up some of those issues. But when I read about uh, outlawing the teaching of critical race theory, it's obvious that these people who pass these laws have no idea what critical race theory is, which is a very complex and subtle thing that comes out of law schools, really. And it would be difficult to find a teacher in an entire state that actually teaches consciously something that an expert would recognize as critical race theory. But when you feel that pressure, the way to avoid possible death of your career is to not teach about it at all. That, that's the way you could avoid the, the thing and that, that's the danger. Um, uh, Scott, let me ask you, uh, again, you, you're not under the same direct threat, both because you're tenured, Gettysburg is private, um, so parents and students can get on social media and perhaps even on television and, and complain about you, but it, it's, you, you can't suffer the same, e easily suffer the same consequences. But how do you deal with this question of how to teach multiple perspectives in history? I mean, all of us know history. Um, there's a naive view of history. Well, history is a bunch of facts and they're either right or they're wrong. And of course, all of us know the history is, the, the facts are subject to interpretation and difficult to understand and their relationship to each other and to us is, is complex. Um, and one argument is, well, you should teach all possible perspectives. And, you know, there are more possible perspectives than anyone can teach. I, I'll just, I, I want to turn this over to you, although I would mention, I just read a couple of days ago, a story of an attempt by an Ohio legislator, I believe it was, to put into law the requirement that social studies teachers in the state of Ohio teach all possible perspectives. And when somebody said, well, what about the Holocaust? She said, well, yeah, after all, the German guards had a perspective. Um, and that was enough to sink the bill. 
it didn't pass, but there's an, ex an extreme example of that. H how do you, Scott, how do you deal with it yourself when you're teaching the Civil War, African-American history, those very complex, multiple perspective uh, courses? Well, there, yeah. There's a way in which uh, you know, the academic in me thinks, well, yes, we can teach all perspectives. That's part of our job. Uh, however, I, I think that can be done in a way, um, if you're gonna teach all perspectives, like the perspectives of the German guards, then you have to teach it in a context, right? So you've gotta give that in a context and you can't give their perspective in a vacuum. And I think there's, and context means teaching evidence, teaching students to be critical thinkers so they can critically analyze all these different perspectives. Uh, but I would not agree with the perspective that says we can teach all perspectives as though they're all morally equivalent. And I understand that uh, so I, uh, historians and philosophers have argued that as you go through history, I think you know Hegel was one of the first ones who said this, articulated that people, as we go through history, as we look back, we have the benefit of all of these years of history. So we can judge the people in the past from a more comprehensive viewpoint. Uh, so I understand sometimes we're going to be judging people and, and evaluating them morally with perspectives that they may not have had at the time, although often they did, because one of the things that I frequently hear in Gettysburg, I go out in the battlefield a lot of times to talk to visitors, is well, we have to understand people from in the context of their time. Well, that's true. But the context of the, there were people in the antebellum era in the United States who were making very clear arguments that slavery, for instance, was wrong and that it was racist. Maybe they didn't use that term then, uh, but they were making that argument. So the context of the time has to include that. But I just got one quick example. Um, a few years ago, we had a historian of the Confederate flags talking here at Gettysburg College, and he was making the argument that we have to understand all perspectives on use of the Confederate flag, whether it's people who are critical of it or people who are flying it proudly. And the way he talked about it is though all sides are morally equivalent. I would agree with him that we need to understand all perspectives, but we also need to understand that some perspectives are using history and context and evidence in a way that is not grounded in solid research in a way that ignores a lot of context in a way that is very selective. And they're using it for very specific political purposes that are tied to protecting their position of power in society. Whereas other groups, their view of the Confederate flag is based on a better grounded history, a more well-rounded understanding of history that's grounded in evidence. And they're often speaking from positions where they are being disadvantaged by the people who want to protect their positions of power. Uh, so I, I have no problem with teaching all perspectives as long as we do it with a critical eye and with that kind of understanding of context and evidence. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if uh, Marcy or Jake has any additional comments on that? Yeah. Uh, Jake, you would start? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I definitely agree with a lot of what Scott was saying uh, about perspective um, and providing context. And then um, I think that, you know, when you think of public school, you have to remember also uh, the logistical part of that as well. Um, and that when you think of the full curriculum uh, that, that we're charged to teach, um, that it becomes pretty quickly uh, apparent that there is no way to teach all perspectives within the amount of time that we have. Um, but we must see that public school is this chance, is this possibility to sustain and develop a respectful public discourse. Um, and it's a chance for everyone's voice to be heard and to count. And so when I think about the sixth grade classroom, you know, we in the middle school classroom and elementary school classroom, it's that we're trying to build community in the classroom where students feel like they can ask honest questions. When we think about considering viewpoints, it's a matter of providing historical facts, yes, and encouraging questions in a non judgmental way. And you have to do a lot of community building and community maintenance in order to have a classroom where students feel like they can ask the questions that have been circling their minds. Otherwise, they'll be quiet and they won't say a word. Uh, we have to approach uh, this kind of community building with an intentionality. And our classrooms, 
they first and foremost have to be a place where a child feels respected and cared for. Uh, and this means understanding the children in the classroom and giving them the time and the different ways to express themselves and to learn how to be in conversation with their peers who may or may not share the same perspectives that they're hearing at home or that they themselves possess. And that's tricky for kids. It's tricky for adults to be able to navigate those different perspectives and have difficult conversations. And so as teachers, I think that students need to know that they can come in and talk to, talk to you, talk to me as someone who'll be, be there and hear them and speak up for them. And part of this is students also knowing that there's no place for meanness or hate of any kind in the classroom. Meanness and hate cannot be allowed. And that is because meanness and hate make people clam up. And it's not what makes space for intellectual growth and development, which is what we're concerned at, uh, concerned with at the K-12 level. Um, so students need that place to discuss things on their terms and to process their ideas uh, and their confusion because there's so much in the world that's confusing. Imagine turning on the news and looking at it through the through the viewpoint of, of a child's eyes. There's so much that that's what is happening as adults. We wonder that, too. Um, and so there has to be that space for them to process those things. And I've always felt that it's one of the greatest honors for teachers that when a student comes to you and they feel like they can tell you that they're having a difficult time or they're struggling um, or that they have this question that they're not sure if it's okay to ask. And for us as teachers, we're there to support those students through that. Um, that's, that is part of their development. And the teachers that I work with and the teachers across New Hampshire, they're all trying their best just to do that, to support students and to be advocates for all students. And the last thing I'd say is just that we should realize that the growing polarization in the country means that there's shrinking space for respectful public dialogue. And public school, public school is one of the last places, one of the last, where people of different backgrounds and beliefs can come together to freely exchange ideas and to learn from one another and to learn to live with one another. And we must recognize the value of sustaining these beloved institutions and the importance of being able to seek out diverse viewpoints to address the problems of today. And again, I feel like the current legislation in New Hampshire is an attack on that. It's a, it's a way to close down that conversation before it even starts through things like self-censorship. Thanks. Uh, Marcy, you also uh, had your hand up, and I, I wonder if any, uh, I'm not sure what experience you have so far as a graduate student, but if you have been teaching sections of undergraduates, for example, uh, a, a, as a graduate TA, how that also might enter in the, those conversations have played out or, or not at, at that level, as well as your experience as a middle school teacher. Thank you, Bill. I do think that in college, there's a lot more wiggle room to have a lot of those open conversations, but I fully agree with everything that Jacob said in terms of creating the community that allows students to feel safe and first and foremost, express whatever opinions they have. Um, but on top of that, I also think that teaching the right information is really important. Um, something that really bothers me about Texas legislation is that they require them to teach about, you know, the history of eugenics and white supremacy, but teach it from an impartial perspective. I find it hard to be impartial with things that condone violence at times and that often um, are racist in nature, right? And while this impartialness, I think it is important in this community building is important. Another question that I'm, I and feel free to answer Jacob or Scott, but is community building possible in a society that as insofar from my opinion, even as teaching college students um, is slowly disappearing. Community is slowly going away from us in so many different ways. And my goal when I was teaching middle school was to try to impart community, impart to influence students and tell them the value of having these safe spaces within their communities to express their opinions, not just outside of the classroom or inside the classroom, excuse me, but outside of the classroom as well. Um, because they're gonna go out and express their opinions, not just in the classroom, right? Um, and I want my students to be prepared to answer any questions that they might you know, face in terms of accuracy or fact, right? Um, 
And I, I also feel like we also live in a state in which if you are um, trying to in, in, enforce these kind of facts, you are often met with violence and hate in a lot of different ways. And it can be very scary to be on the other side. Um, so and, and I think that's really why a lot of my own students often fail to speak up is because of both sides. Right. This fear that they will be reprimanded um, for being too left, too right. Right. Too centrist one thing or the other. And that goes for both middle school through high school into college. Um, a lot of my students in my discussion sections barely speak when we talk about racism, eugenics, when we talk about classism, when we talk about things like gender. Um, and I think it's in part because of their fear that if they say something wrong, right, whatever might be deemed wrong, um, they're going to get demonized and, chast and chastised in front of the, the classroom. Um, and I never want a student to feel that way, regardless of what their thought process is, because the reality is that, you know, we are all in this together and we're all learning from each other, you know. Thanks. Um, Scott, how do you think that as is working, you know, again, at, at, a, at a college level, um, Marcy mentioned the fact that even at a in college discussion sections, perhaps especially in college discussion sections, students may be afraid to give an opinion because they'll be called a racist or they'll be called an anti, you know, anti-white or whatever it happens to be. And, um, and also to some extent, those of you who have taught for a while, have you felt that this has been changing since you started teaching? Um, have you felt the changes specifically, some of you have alluded to this, but is it getting harder? Maybe Scott, you could start with that. I, for me, I don't think it's changed a whole lot. I think it's always been hard, um, but it also varies according to the makeup of the class. When I've had the rare times I've had a majority black class or majority non-white class, it's a very different vibe. Uh, but Gettysburg College is a predominantly white school. And so most of my classes, majority white students, sometimes there's, it's almost, it's 90% or all white students. Um, yeah, so there's a variety of ways, like Mars is saying about thinking about community of trying to let students know that uh, they can ask questions. And if sometimes it, you know, I tell some of it's so as a an African American professor, you know, I have to recognize uh, many of them have never had a black professor or non-white teacher in their lives when they've come here. So it's about breaking down some of those things. But I think that's that's been true since I started teaching. When I was a teaching assistant at UNH, that was true. And that's still true. Um, and I, a lot of times with white students, I tell them, they're not going to tell me something that I haven't heard before. You know, there's nothing they're going to say that's going to surprise me. Uh, so they might as well just give it their best shot. And we can be honest but civil, uh, kind of like what Jacob said. It's not about being mean, things like that. Uh, but I do, I think the fear of what you're talking about is true, but some of it, I think is on us as educators. So I find like this whole thing about critical race theory, the discussion be fascinating. I agree. It's not taught in schools on any kind of sophisticated level or deep level. However, uh, when we use terms like white privilege, which is a thing, it's a real thing. There's plenty of scholarship behind it. But I think to most white Americans and white students who kind of bristle at the word privilege, if you don't have a thorough grounding in the academics behind it and the research behind it, yeah, of course you're gonna bristle. So I think I have a job as an educator to figure out how to approach those conversations in a way that are not gonna put them immediately on the defensive. I have found, for instance, often if I ask questions like, do you think white Americans in general over time have had more advantages? They'll say, yeah. You know, so it's sometimes about finding different words uh, for where they're at. Thanks, uh, Marcy, you had your hand up. Yeah, absolutely. I think that Scott makes a completely valid point in saying that. I think a lot of these students are also being introduced to the realities of being intersectional. Being human is incredibly complex. We have a lot of layers to who we are and what we want to be. And a lot of students in the coming of age college situation are starting to realize the nuances and complexities that come along with being human, right? The fact that you are more than your skin color, you're more than your class, you're more than your gender, right? And so I think that that's another conversational layer that ends up happening with a lot of these college students that is 
very much within the realm of what a lot of people think CRT is when we talk about these words, such as Scott said, like what privilege, intersectionality, right, white supremacy. Um, but those are really key pivotal terms to being able to understand our own history, right? And being able to teach those courses in the first place and being afraid of those words really isn't going to make the conversation grow or shrink, but it's just going to leave it stagnant, which in my opinion is a lot worse, right? Um, you're not doing really anything positive for the students. I have found that when presenting things both at the middle school, high school, and collegiate level, because I do still sub within middle school and high school um, in several districts, you know, like it, it is, it's very much about presenting it in that way, right? Layering it on top of one another, asking them questions about themselves, right? Where do they fall on this sort of reality of being complex and human? Um, but that's my take on on that. And I just wanted to, to add my two cents. Uh, thanks. Um, so we have a couple of questions and one of them in particular, I want you guys, particularly the current middle school or recent middle school teachers to address. One, I'll try to do myself because it's about whether um, in the Southern states, you're more likely to learn that the Civil War was about states' rights, whereas in the northern states that it was about slavery. And that's actually a fairly complicated question because each state can be very, very different. And, you know, Texas is not North Carolina, is not Virginia, and, and, and so forth. Um, at the college level, people use college textbooks, and basically all of them today say the Civil War was about slavery. And that's because the Civil War was about slavery. Uh, if you read the, the statements made by Texans, when they seceded, it was, we're doing this because of the threats to slavery. I mean, it's, it's really quite straightforward. The idea that it was about state rights really appears more after the war than before. Um, and at the, you know, K to 12 level, it just depends on each state's education association and which textbooks they adopt and so forth. Um, so it, it's kind of unpredictable. Um, on, uh, but I'd like to particularly get to this question by a prospective teacher who said, can you give, I'm not sure whether it was a him or a her advice about how to prepare for this, that it's kind of demoralizing being in training to be a teacher and seeing all of these disputes and so forth. And what advice can you give them? <clears throat> uh, Scott, you raise your hand. Uh, Cause this is more, I think in Jacob Morris's wheelhouse, but the senior seminar students that I just taught this spring, this is what they wanted to know because several of them are going into what you all are doing. Uh, and it was in some ways heartbreaking to have to tell them things like, you need to be really careful what you do your senior seminar research paper on because if it involves critical race theory, anything that sounds like that and somebody can find that online, they might not hire you. Uh, so you know, part of how I'm preparing them from a college level is that you, you've got to be careful about what you think and say and write, which is depressing, but I, I think I would right. not be doing them a service if I didn't at least prompt them to think about that. Yeah, but I, maybe I, you can tell me if I'm being paranoid. Uh, well, I'll, I'll avoid that, but it, I, if I can understand that it could be demoralizing. But uh, Jake, Marcy, advice to prospective teachers. I will say that on, on a personal level, at least for me, um, I, be, being a teacher is scary. Um, I'm fairly young. And so I believe the person who asked this question also might be particularly young. And to, uh, my advice to anybody who's going into the teaching profession is please do not give up. These students need you so much in their lives. They need so much inspiration and passion and care in their day-to-day -day lives and educations. And by showing them that you do care about them and that you are willing to put in the effort for them, you will not believe the reward that comes with them. I still keep in touch with every single one of my students that I taught within the last two years. And I find it so amazing that they grow from their experiences and they still reach out to me and ask questions um, because they trust me and they know that I will be honest with them and be an educator to them. Um, I also want to say that in terms of the, the the context of CRT, do yourself the favor. And I, you know, when I was becoming a teacher, when I was getting certified to be a teacher, the first thing I did was really learn what was up and coming in the lay of the law. 
um, because the reality is the law has to say it at the end of the day. And I, I want people to feel protected. I want you as a teacher to be protected. So do yourself a favor, read up on what's really going on in your state or your location, wherever you're at, and be prepared to meet people who want to question you and want to challenge you, even when you don't want to be challenged. Um, because that was something that happened quite frequently within my school, not to me personally, but to a lot of other teachers, right? Debates upon parent-teacher conferences. What are you teaching to my child? Why are they coming home talking about this or that, right? Um, and I have always said with lesson planning, I always left a little box to myself, right? What are some potential issues or questions that parents might have about this lesson, right? I always left that box for myself, always, right? Right. Uh, Jake? Yeah, I, I know that uh, when you look at the data for the last couple years uh, since the passage of HB2 and with COVID also, that uh, UNH and uh, other teacher preparation programs have seen a significant drop off in the number of aspiring teachers who are enrolling in these programs. And I agree with Marcy. Uh, the students, students need you. Students need quality teachers. They need people who are going through excellent teacher ed programs uh, like the University of New Hampshire's uh, five-year program, um, which I'll just put a plug in. You're with a you're with a uh, an experienced teacher for a full year in the classroom, and so so many of those questions and, and great points that uh, Marcy was just bringing up that like you're like oh I'm uncertain what do I do in this situation or that situation, you have the chance to be with a professional community uh, who are discussing these things on a daily basis and can support you on a daily basis as well, um, and and for myself you know going through that program over ten years ago now. Uh, it was invaluable then, and I can imagine, you know, that that now it's even more valuable. The other thing is, I would say, don't be afraid to to reach out. Um, if you have questions and you want to learn more uh, or want to want to talk more one on one, um, you can you can certainly reach out, and I'm and I think you can find find me pretty easily if you'd like to talk with me. Um, but I, I think we have to be real um, about you know the direction that we're heading. Um, and the direction that we're heading right now is um, the NEA, the National Education Association, uh, in a study last January said that, you know, over the next 10 years, there's going to be an increase in the number of teachers needed in secondary uh, schools. And right now, there's an exodus. Uh, there's an exodus because of COVID and because of these, the ridiculous pressure uh, that's being put on the profession. And that's, as I said earlier, by design. And so I think that forums like this are fantastic in the sense that we can talk about what's really happening and try to encourage people to still do that hard work. Um, Marcy earlier had asked, you know, like, is community building, you know, it, can we still do it, you know, with this happening? And it's like, yes, that's the most important thing. It's so difficult to do. Um, and, and I'd encourage just anyone who's interested, you know, to, to stay the course, you know, you got it. We have to do hard things. That's where we are right now, you know, as a community, as a state, as a nation, we've got to do hard things um, for our kids and for our, for our country. Uh, thanks. So we're, we only have four or five minutes left. So, uh, and we may not get to all these questions because of that, but the questions will exist and perhaps some of the panelists will be able to reach out to answer them. But one, uh, and given the topic, it'll be hard, but if you could say, um, spend a minute or so, maybe a couple of minutes saying, how do you, one, dealt with the issue of social media? How do you be a teacher when people, there's so much stuff going on on social media that complicates everything you do because people are reading things that are often wrong or complicated and so forth? Uh, and and are, is there anything you feel you're doing with it right now? Marcy? I do want to bring up an example that recently happened here at the Oyster River Cooperative over the summer in which they hired a individual who, the, I, well, I don't know if, I want, I want to use the correct pronouns. I don't know if she's she, they, um, but 
Um, essentially, uh, she got in trouble for some social media tweets as she had a podcast that was degrading to white people. Um, and it was something that was brought up very strenuously during a lot of these meetings, these board meetings and these community meetings. And I'm a good believer and I, I don't have a Twitter. I try to avoid using Instagram and Facebook too openly or publicly. Um, I think the best course of action always is to avoid them. But if social media didn't exist, I also think that this would it would not perpetuate a lot of the misinformation that a lot of students get a hold of. Um, something that I do view a lot just because I like to see what's happening is TikTok. And at you, you know, I'm sure many of you won't be surprised to hear the amount of things, incorrect information that I hear on TikTok, right? And I believe the spread of misinformation probably would have been nowhere near us to what it is now. It is so easy to put something online and have somebody just believe it for face value or for what people think it really is, when the reality of situations can be a lot more complicated than what might appear as a 140 character mm -hmm. tweet. It's not plain and simple. Kind of multiplies the complications of a complex uh, teaching life. Um, Jake, have you had any had to deal directly with this issue of social media students coming in with misinformation that they got it or complaints online, you know, about you or colleagues? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my number one reaction to it is just concern about the mental health of students who are consuming social media um, and consuming it at a, at a level that, you know, it over, it overtakes their life. Um, and it really just, it limits what they can do in terms of engaging with other, other kids in a real way. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I echo kind of what Marcy was saying in terms of just um, trying to encourage kids to be responsible and also having a, a, a kind of a social media diet um, and also kind of thinking about how to have, um, you know, resources to understand and investigate, you know, what is what is actually happening. But I think it comes back to that point of like, you know, kids being able to bring these things in. And it just happens that what they're bringing in now is questions about what's happening online and concerns about what's happening online. Um, and the realness of those things. And, and it seems like more and more, there, those lines are kind of being blurred um, between what's what's real happening in life and what's happening online for kids. And I think that can be a really scary thing for kids to not really know, to lose a sense of, of reality in that way. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because one question we really will not have time enough to address in any kind of depth was specifically about how does this kind of issue uh, intersect with what is a somewhat sort of independently potential disaster in a way is the mental health crisis that many students have been feeling, uh, not partly because of the world, partly because of the pandemic and what's going on in school and so forth. So I'm glad you brought that up because clearly social media in very complicated ways that probably no one entirely understands undoubtedly contributes to mental health problems as well as undoubtedly contributes to, you know, good things in life and, and making connections uh, among people. But it's uh, I think it's a little bit beyond our ability to address at this point. Um, we have about 30 seconds if someone wants to make a last comment. Scott, you had your hand up. On the social media question, I just say one thing that I do in classes, I actually use it. I have students follow the sources of people that post things and look at the evidence that they use, if how it's being used, for what purpose it's being used. Uh, for instance, Christopher Rufo have had students follow the sources that he uses when he talks about critical race theory and send them on their own research journey. And usually what they find is the evidence that's being used is questionable and it's circular. Uh, a good point to make use of it in your teaching directly and let the students try to, try to figure it out. And uh, this has been a great conversation. We've had lots of people. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single question. Thanks so much to all our panelists. If all of our teachers were like these three people, we wouldn't be in such a crisis. I'm very confident and I really appreciate all of your participation. So with that, it's we've uh, gotten pretty much to the end. So I'll say goodbye. And uh, again, I believe you'll be able to contact uh, the individuals or at least write the Alumni Association but for a further question and you might be able to get some more uh, response for some of the things we weren't able to get to.